welcome back to Thursday Bible Study. My name is Cassie Waits, and I am so glad that you're part of our conversation today. As we begin our time together, let us pray. God of all blessings, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the chance to gather together. We lift up to you this morning our prayers. We pray for those who are sick, especially those struggling with COVID-19. Keep them safe, O oh Lord. We pray for those who are recovering from illness. We pray for all who are lonely and isolated. We pray for those who are feeling disoriented this morning. And we pray for all who are living in fear. Draw them close to you, Lord. Keep them safe. We also lift up to you our praises for relationships that are growing stronger every day, for time to rest and listen and hear your voice. Thank you, Lord, for this chance to pause and to see your glory in creation. Thank you, Lord, for providing all that we need. Thank you for giving us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love. Help us to trust you, to trust in your guidance, in your protection, in your provision. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are excited to welcome Pat Hankey today on the piano. She is so very gifted, and this is a real treat. So let's join our voices together as we sing our opening hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Matthew 12, 43 to 45. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through waterless regions, looking for a resting place, but it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it comes, it finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits, more evil than itself, and they enter and live there. And the last state of that person is worse than the first so it will be also with this evil generation. Callus covers this parable in chapter five of his second book, More Parables from the Backside. And that chapter he titles, The Danger of Being Good and Empty. And why not? Because this parable doesn't really have a title. Um, it's wedged in with a very long teaching that Jesus is giving to a crowd of people. And it's not called out explicitly as a parable in the Gospel of Matthew. And we actually find this teaching both in Matthew chapter 12 and in Luke chapter 11. 
So we have this very brief parable. It's a, really an illustration of what Jesus is trying to say, which is that the, 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 the people he's, he's addressing here are the Pharisees and the scribes. What he's trying to say is that they are, they are not good people. He, he's, he, right before this parable, he's compared them. Um, he said that they're actually worse than the people of Nineveh, the people of Nineveh that Jonah prophesied to. Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because the people were so evil. Um, they were just the worst of the worst. And Jesus is saying, well, the people of Nineveh are going to condemn you. You're so bad, right? The, he doesn't pull punches here. And he goes on to illustrate his point by telling this parable. And so if we, we take it as a parable, uh, we remember we have a definition of a parable. A parable is a short story designed to provoke thought and teach a religious or moral principle or general truth. It includes real or literal occurrence to which the audience can relate. Now we also know that parables, that word parable or parabola in Greek, it means to throw alongside. And so in, in most parables we have uh, things that we can relate to and a new idea that's being explained by the things we can relate to. So we turn to this parable, I, I want to ask you two things. One is who are the characters? And two, what are the elements of daily life that are highlighted in this parable? In terms of characters, we only have a few in this parable. We have the man, we have the first unclean spirit, and then we have seven additional unclean spirits that show up at the end of the parable. We've also talked about the idea of a surprise twist, and most parables have a surprise twist. This parable does too, especially if you just read the parable. If you didn't know that Jesus was in the middle of condemning these people, and you just read the parable, you might wonder whether you were in a success story or not, at least if you read the first half. So there's a man, he has an unclean spirit. Unclean spirit gets driven out. Hooray, and we can celebrate now. And we think if that's the end of the story, that is a success story. But then Jesus keeps talking, of course, and our, our celebration turns to disappointment because the man cleans up his house and there's nothing that's put in the place of that unclean spirit. The unclean spirit comes back and fights all his buddies and now we have the man in a worse place than he started. And so this is the surprise twist. Not that he, he kicked his habit, he got on the bandwagon and stayed there, but that he, he, he tried, he did this, and then he, and then he failed. And, and not just, you know, he's not just back where he started, he's in a far worse position than he started. So let's take a minute and reflect. When have you celebrated a life improvement only to fall off the bandwagon later? I would love to hear your near success stories, but I'm going to have to imagine what they are for now. I imagine some of you thought of New Year's resolutions that went bad. So three weeks into the new year and that gym membership that you paid for, you're not using anymore. Or you're in the month of February, you did okay in January, but in February you, you stopped eating healthy and you're back to your old junk food. But for some of you, on a, on a very serious note, this question about when you've tried to, to make a life improvement and then, and then fallen off that bandwagon may have to do with really destructive habits, um, addiction to alcohol or drugs or something else that you have been wrestling with. And so what we know is that it's really difficult to disentangle ourselves from, from bad habits, even if they are destructive to us. And so we understand that these near success stories are sometimes funny, but we also know that a lot of times they're tragic. One of my college friends uh, about five years ago fell into depression and then alcoholism. And he nearly died, destroyed his liver, and this was a wake-up call. He got better, 
and he was good for, uh, for months, maybe even a, a year or so, he was good. We thought he was good, we thought he was doing better, staying healthy, and then he slid backward again. And he slid and he slid and he slid and he never recovered. And so at the age of 35, I find myself at a funeral with a bunch of young parents. There are toddlers running around, there are babies everywhere. And I'm trying to explain to my daughter what a funeral is and why mommy's friend is in the casket. And it's one of those moments that, that you, you just realize that these near success stories, they have real consequences. There are real consequences here. So we understand the story is absolutely deadly serious, that it is all too often the case that we, we kick one habit and we think that we, we've got it, we think we're, we're good, we think we're healthy, we think we're back, but we're not. And we end up like this man with this perfectly clean house that the unclean spirit comes back. It doesn't just come back by itself, but brings a lot of friends along. So at this point, we might wonder, well, what is the man to do? What, you know, what, what could he have done differently? What, what are the, the Pharisees and the scribes supposed to do with this biting condemnation that Jesus is offering them? What lesson are they to draw from it? What lesson might we draw from it? Callus suggests that the man seems to do one thing wrong. Uh, in particular, and that is he cleaned up his house, but he never filled it with anything else. He just cleaned it up. He appeared to change his life. He treated all of the symptoms, the outward symptoms, right? But he didn't actually treat the disease. He doesn't replace what was filling him, that unclean spirit that was filling him, with a clean heart and a clean spirit, new life that only God offers. And so here is the implication. When we are clean and empty, we are still very vulnerable. We need God's Spirit to fill us, or else we wind up just like that man. It looks good, but there's nothing, it's vulnerable, it's fragile, it's a house of cards. So that leads us to our second reflection question. which How might we be good, but empty in our faith? All this talk about houses is bringing me back to last year when my family was looking for a new house. And there were two main types of houses that we walked into. We looked all around the Marietta area. Some houses were, were perfectly sanitized. The families had taken all of their personal items and hidden them away, and the houses were just beautiful, but they were sterile. They were, they were like, it was like being in a magazine cover. There were other houses that felt authentic. They might have been just as organized, they would have been just as clean, but when you walked in, you could feel the kind of family that lived there. And ultimately, the house that we, we went with was a house like that. We just felt that there was a family here, there was love here, and it felt differently than some of those picture-perfect sterile houses. Another way to think about this parable is that as Christians, we might display uh, a certain image that makes people think, oh, that person has it all together. Their faith life is, uh, is unshakable. It's obvious from, for all of these signs that we can see as we observe the outside looking in. But the truth is, we can very easily be good but empty people if we do not allow God's Spirit to take root in our hearts and indwell within us. 
and the difference between the Christian who is good and empty and the Christian who is good and filled with God's Spirit is the difference in those two kinds of houses. They're both beautiful, but there's something missing in the empty one. Being empty is not just an inconvenience, it is an incredible danger. Because when we clean that house up, we kick out that unclean spirit, we are in a fragile, fragile place if we do not allow the Spirit of God to take root in our hearts, to fill us, to empower us, we are at risk, like the man was at risk. Seven more unclean spirits will overwhelm us, that we will be spiritually assaulted. And if we are, and if we are empty, we will not have the resources to withstand it. And that is the danger of being good and empty. Thank you for being part of Thursday Bible Study. Until next time, may the Lord bless you, be gracious to you, and give you peace.